sustaining members to make it possible. Did you knock on the door yet? Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Public Works Finance Committee regular meeting of the Moscow City of Council for January 9th, 2017. First item on the agenda is the approval of the Public Works Finance <laughs> Committee December 12th, 2016 minutes. And Gina and I were there, and I'm, in, I'm okay with them. Me too. So get them approved. I'll abstain since I wasn't. I was on the other committee at that time. We'll call them approved. Uh, the next thing on the agenda is to select a committee chair and vice chair for this year, 2017. And this entertain a I would, nomination. I would propose that you be the chair. And I don't care about vice chair. What do you? I like vice chair. There you go. I'll be vice chair. You can we you can chair last year, right? So you can move vice, out of I the was vice chair. You can move out of the executive yeah. limelight for one year. Works for me. Okay. All those in favor of those nominations? Aye. 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 Okay. So I'll be the chair for this year, and Gina will be the vice chair. Cool. The third item on the agenda is the disbursement report for December 16th. Gary and Sarah are in charge of that. I don't see Sarah Sarah's here. Sarah's sick today, so I will fly solo. You have in front of you, um, in the CCSR, you have the information about um, disbursements, as you can see, were at one million eight hundred twenty-nine thousand four hundred ninety-nine dollars uh, for uh, December of 2016. Uh, major expenditures: we've got, um, let's see, two hundred seventy-six thousand dollars of professional services, um, supplies of forty-seven thousand, uh, construction of right at eighty thousand dollars. So you've got 91% of the uh, amounts that um, are contained in there in the, the uh, major expenditures. So with that, I'll answer any questions. Sue's here to back me up if she needs to. The professional <laughs> services, Gary, big number. What? Uh, Makes sense. Uh, the major ones are the Titan Technologies for the Southwest Sewer Trunk Line, uh, which is fifty-seven thousand uh, dollars. Boert Long Year, oh, excuse me, thirty-three thousand seven twenty-nine. Boert Long Year for well number ten. Uh, we still have a retainage on there, but that's fifty-seven thousand uh, dollars. Let's see. Have some security for some public projects. Uh, regional public transportation. We had our quarterly of thirty-six thousand on that as well. So those are the majors. What's retainage mean, sir? Retainage on a contract. You retain a certain amount of it until the contract is finished up and you finally approve it, and then the retainage is released. Thank you. <coughs> With that, I'll answer any other questions. Otherwise, would appreciate a motion to approve. I'm good. All right. Well, consider Walter saying I'm good will be a motion to approve. <laughs> I'll second that. <laughs> and uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. And aye. You need the blue pen? Yeah, you need the blue pen. Okay. So I'm going to have to do that. That's what I did. All right. <clears throat> While Walter signs that, we'll get on to the number four on the agenda. It's the first quarter financial report, October 1st to December 31st, 2016. Gary and Sarah. Well, Gary flying solo again on this one. Okay. Uh, quarterly financials. Uh, by law, we have to publish our quarterly financials. This is the quarter for the uh, quarter beginning um, October 1st and ending the end of December. Uh, what we look for is you've got in your packets. Thank you, sir. 
as you've got in your packets, what we look for are anything uh, that's an aberration. <coughs> as we've got 25% of the uh, year gone, you look to make sure that you're within uh, where you need to be. There are some things like in revenues, <coughs> excuse me, we won't receive our bulk of our uh, tax payment from Latok County until this month, and then again, I believe, in July or August, as I recall. So every quarter. Well, we receive property tax every month. Okay. Do you want to come up forward? So in case there's a gap here, we're able to pick that up. Yeah, we, we receive property tax payments every month along with um, the other revenue that comes in. And the big revenue for the city comes in for property tax every January and July. And then um, we see some bigger pockets like in those following months right after that. The other big revenues that are missing that come in quarterly are the state shared revenues, the sales tax revenue, highway user tax, uh, liquor tax. Um, I think that's and we'll receive those the in the quarter behind. Mm -hmm. um, so we look at revenues to see if we're meeting or exceeding, uh, knowing that cycle. We also have on uh, expenditures, you'll see some expenditures where we'll have expended almost nothing up till now, and those are typically construction projects for the following year, so on and so forth. So that being said, it appears that we're doing uh, pretty well moving along. Uh, nothing extraordinary to report. Um, if you look on the last page, it's a summary of all that previous information, and it looks like we're tracking very well. Mr. Steed? Sue, the uh, sanitation operation expenses are only 15%, mm -hmm. as opposed to the 25% fiscal year calendar. Any idea why? I just not saw it. On the expenses, um, that I'm not aware of. Yeah, they lag as well. We get billed uh, the expenditure or the uh, obligation to pay fell in December, but does not. Uh, we don't pay it until January. So again, there, you got a lag time for some of these things. Net thirty or net twenty, whatever. I know. It is. I know there are a lot of them that lag. Like <clears throat> water revenues mm -hmm. stay off until we get into the summer. And exactly. Well, and also you. Even though um, in October those expenses that we would normally pay for are accrued for September in the previous year. So when we get to this year in the first quarter, we kind of look like we're lagging a little bit. And then when we get to the fourth quarter, we're It'll bigger. It'll all catch up. It'll all catch up. Okay. Right on. Okay. okay. Any further Thank questions? You, mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Sue. That's all I have on that matter, sir. <clears throat> okay, I guess I'll entertain a motion to approve the first quarter financial report. I move to approve and put it on consent agenda. I second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay, item number five, uh, lot five, block four of the Anderson first lot division. Uh, Ryan Cash is going to uh, present us with a program on that. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Go. So before you today, we have a lot division request for an unaddressed parcel. So we've got that identified as Lot 25, Block 4 of the Anderson First Edition. This is the subject property as a street view. It's currently located at the corner of Sunnyside Avenue and Pearl Circle. So just for orientation, we have this aerial perspective. We have, we have as far as the overall <coughs> site is located, we have it identified in the red, uh, going in a counterclockwise rotation. We have Plus River Drive to the south, and then the intersection of Sunnyside and Pearl Circle to the northeast. The northern property is abutted by multiple properties along Sunnyside, Anderson Drive, and Fletcher. The western property boundary abuts Anderson Park 
and the southwest corner of the property of Butts, Pearl Circle, and the back of Curb, back to our original point of start. The overall zoning for this site, as you can see here, we have two separate zones that fall within this site. To the north, we have R3, medium residential. To the south is R4, multifamily residential, which continues all the way down to Plus River Drive to the south, as well as Gritman Rehab to the east. And all the adjoining zoning restrictions and the, the zoning uh, identified on this plan are R1 to the north. <coughs> even Anderson Park to the west is identified as R1. Again, the identified property is identified as a, a lot division request as per Lawn Fletcher's request. The existing lot is 3.6 acres or 160,881 square feet. The applicant filed for a lot division for two parcels as indicated in this survey map. Uh, the, the indication is shown right there where the proposed lot division is going to take place. The eastern portion of the lot is to be parceled as 1.34 acres and the parcel to the west is slated and requested for 2.35 acres for development. So after we're done with our familiarization we're going to go into a little bit more detail on the, the zoning districts involved on this particular site. For R3 zoning district the minimum lot width is 20 feet for townhome dwellings, 60 feet for single and two family dwellings. The minimum lot area 2,000 square feet for townhome dwellings, 5,000 square feet for single and two family dwellings. The maximum building height is 35 feet, and the required setbacks are as follows. The minimum front setback is 15 feet or 20 feet for a garage facing the street. The rear is 20 feet. The street side is 13 feet or 20 feet for a garage facing the street. And the side yard setback is a five foot minimum, and the sum of the two shall not be less than 10 feet. Other conditional uses permitted on an R3 site would be schools, commercial schools and education institutions and other supplementary regulations that actually are involved with this particular site is a 12-foot type A planting buffer located between the zoning districts. Since the R3 and R4 zone abut an R1 district, those will be required. Now that we've gone over the, the northern zoning district, uh, the southern portion of that particular property is an R4 zoning district. The minimum lot width for townhome dwellings is 18 feet. Single and multiple family dwellings are 50 feet. The minimum lot area is 1,800 feet for townhome dwellings, and single and multifamily dwellings are 5,000 square feet. Setbacks are as follows for an R4. <coughs> the front is 15 feet, 20 feet for garage facing the street. Rear is 20 feet. Street side is 13 feet or 20 feet for a garage facing the street, and the side is a 5 foot minimum with a sum of two shall be, not be less than 15 feet. And again, the same uh, conditional uses are as follows. The schools, commercial zones, commercial schools, and educational institutions would require a conditional use uh, and are permitted on those sites, as well as the supplementary regula regulations, again, are involved with a 12-foot type A planting buffer located between the zoning districts. There are some rezone conditions on this property. In 1993, on July 12th, there was a city council meeting where it had the subject property was rezoned from farm ranch and outdoor recreation to R3 and R4 with three conditions. Number one, the density shall be limited to 2,000 square feet per dwelling unit. Number two states that the building shall be limited to one story exclusive of basements. And number three, there shall be dedicated to see Moscow a pedestrian pathway, minimum of 10 feet in width extending from Laytaw Care Center, which is now Gribbon Rehab, to the Anderson Frontier Park. SAS recommendation, uh, take public comment if applicable and recommend approval of the lot division request with no new conditions. And of course, per city of Moscow requirements for lot divisions, property owners within 600 feet have been notified and the site has been posted seven days prior to the public meeting. And at this point, I'd like to open up if you have any questions for me. Mr. Steed? There is no request to rezone any of this property along with this no sir it would it would leave it split between r3 and r4 yes sir gina anything no i don't have anything i'd like to hear public and, comment and, if there's and, any um, and and the three conditions on the pre on the 1993 rezone applied to both the r3 and the r4 yes sir it's for the, to the, the entire property. property yes sir 
That is correct. Okay, I guess we're in a position where we can take public comment. If anybody in the general public wants to make a comment on this uh, proposed lot division, please come forward and state your name and address and tell us what you think about the situation. live in the prospect your name and address I'm please. sorry I'm sorry my Kathy Henson um, 2075 <coughs> Sunny City <coughs> Avenue um, we live in the prospect place division which connects to um, Anderson Park um, and so we're right there on Pearl Circle and we've known about this and we've listened to Lon Fletcher and I think you know what he has has planned you know for the Palouse Prairie Charter School to have the, what is it, the 2.35 acres, and then the Lataw Trust, the 1.34 acres. And I think we're all fine with that. Um, I, I think we had all hoped it would be single family dwellings. That's kind of when we all moved in there and built, that was the original plan, but things change. And so, um, I think it's, there's just the two families here representing the, um, the the 12 families that live in Prospect Place. So I don't think we have any any other concerns. Um, yeah, we've met with him twice, and he's um, so. So as far as you I, know, the neighbors don't have any major objections to splitting a lot. Splitting a lot. No, no, I think it's just what's going to go in there i mean um at one point they talked about putting in apartments and that was a concern because it is family um it is single dwellings um but i think that's not what the plan is unless it changes from, as far as we know it's um it's going to be leased to the palouse prairie charter school and um we have one one woman who will be bordering the, the the property but they had talked about um, they will uh, erect a fence between her and the school um, they also asked could they use our private drive prospect place owns Pearl Drive or Pearl Circle and they had asked would it be possible in case of an emergency would we allow emergency vehicles up through there and we were in agreement to that. Um, definitely not for public to be going in and out of there because we maintain the road ourselves. But um, for emergency vehicles, we're fine with that. So I and, think. And they would be responsible for maintaining and opening a, a gate or whatever to. We'd need to have some kind of a gate or something to discourage. Well, to, yeah, right. otherwise it will get used by the public if exactly. it's not gated. So. Exactly, yeah, and so that, that was the plan, you know, that there would be a gate or some sort of barrier, but that could be opened for emergency vehicles. So, okay. Okay. Just, just to clarify, since there has been a, a request already for a lot division as well as a conditional use, the larger of the two parcels, that west parcel up there, that is slated for a, a conditional use permit. Uh, we already have it in the works. So contingent upon this lot division will then open us up for the process of holding another public hearing for the Palouse Prairie uh, Charter School development. Okay. Uh, so that once this gets locked in, uh, it will hopefully gets locked in, uh, then at that point we'll roll into a conditional use and then we'll be able to go through further details as far as ingress, egress, and, and the whole other steps that we would take to ensure that we have proper circulation. Yeah, getting kind of far down the road here. This is for a lot division, not for the individual development requests. So. Um, any decision by the committee to proceed with it will not affect the comments uh, going forward for any CUP or anything like yeah. that. Okay. So, okay. Thank you, yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, yeah. Thank you. Anyone else care to speak <clears throat> to this issue? Excuse my dress, I had to come here straight from work. So, yeah. Lon Fletcher, I live at 5308 Linville Road. Moscow, Idaho, <coughs> and I'm the one requesting the lot split. Um, the 
purpose of it is to allow so we can move forward with Palouse Char Charter School and then the land trust. It seemed to be a good option that I felt well about rather than trying to develop par apartments or selling it to it another developer and put apartments or duplexes in there. And I just really thought this would be a good use for it. So okay. we're moving forward with the process, and this is step one. All right. Thank you for your comments, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Anyone else? All right. Uh, I guess we can – I would move to put this on regular agenda for the next city council yeah. meeting. I'm, I would agree with that. Yeah, same here. Okay. Thank All you. those in favor Thank of that? You. Yeah. I, okay. All right. Thank you, Thank you Ryan. Thank very you much for your presentation. You Are you recommending approval? We're, yeah, we're audit? recommending approval. And, okay. But it should be heard <clears throat> by the entire <clears throat> council. Got it. Indeed. All right. Uh, item six on today's agenda is 1912 Center Roofing System Replacement Project, and Dave Schott's going to tell us about that. Welcome, Dave. Good afternoon. Uh, this oh. is the um, 1912 Center Roofing System Replacement Project. Staff seeking authorization to proceed with the project. A little background. In 2016, the 1912 Center Facilities Development Committee uh, discussed the idea of repair or replacement of the 1912 Center roof. Uh, to this end, uh, we hired a consultant. Uh, to do an evaluation report for the roof. Uh, this was done by Associated Architects, uh, and they submitted their uh, report in uh, September of 2016. In the report, uh, it uh, indicates the roof was completely removed and replaced uh, in 2001 uh, with a reinforced thermoplastic poly, uh, a TPO membrane roof. This is a membrane type, uh, type roof. Uh, the roof is uh, 10,200 square feet, divided into three major areas. For single-ply uh, TPO-type membrane roofs, the life expectancy is really 12 to 15 years. Uh, in the evaluation report, uh, the roof appeared to be in relatively good condition. However, it did have some deficiencies. There is some leaking um, that would need to be addressed to mitigate leaking and extend the service life for a couple years for the roof. Uh, the evaluation report also included options for roofing replacements. This is a breakdown of the options. In option one, this is a repair. Uh, we did reach out to the uh, contractor that's currently doing the maintenance on the roof. Uh, they thought those repairs would be in the neighborhood of about $32,000. As part of the valuation report, two options were presented um, for replacement. One was the armor light roof, which is a metal roof. The other option was a, another uh, membrane type roof. And I'd just note that option two was our staff recommendation through this process. Evaluation of the options. Uh, we evaluated and we're recommending the Armor Light metal roof. This does come with a 30 year warranty. Uh, the uh, 1912 committee really thought the cost of repairing at 32000 was a little much for the short term and not addressing the long term um, issues with the roof. Um, the consultant also mentioned that the University of Idaho and the Moscow School District are really moving towards this armor light system. I reached out to both them. Uh, the <coughs> Moscow School District is happy with the roof. Uh, they're, they're finding they're getting more uh, service life out of that than the membrane roof. Uh, the university was really happy with the product. They're having a, a couple of issues. What they identified as maybe installation issues. So we need to make sure it gets installed correctly. There's uh, one manufacturer that serves this region, Garland, um, but within that one manufacturer, there are six pre-qualified installers, so we can get a competitive bid on this. Um, we thought the Armor Light roof was slightly more cost-effective than the other one, uh, membrane-type roof. So uh, we've been accumulating funds for this project over the years. The 
This is a breakdown of uh, preliminary cost estimates. The Armor Light roof was at 156,730 uh, with a contingency on that. Uh, professional services uh, to provide construction drawings uh, and construction administration for the project was 7,600. Uh, the fees were waived, and then there's be an arts component um, for a total of a preliminary cost estimate of $181,570. The timeline. With authorization to proceed, I will work with the constru uh, consultant to develop construction drawings and bid documents, uh, hopefully bidding in mid-March. Uh, there'll be a bid evaluation. I will bring that back to committee and council in March, April. Um, and then notice of award, notice to proceed, um, and then get construction started. I would note that this is weather department uh, dependent. This is best case scenario. So it's my understanding from the consultant that he has to physically go up and measure the roof, roof to get um, construction drawings going. And he thought it would be about a six-week process. But the first linchpin of that is measuring the roof. Um, he physically has to do that. And with our weather, we've got a lot of snow up there. So uh, there may be a, a little bit of a delay in that. So we are recommending authorization uh, to proceed with the project and uh, move forward. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions or comments from the administrative committee. Um, Dave, the, the arts component, how does that work? If, if you put $1,567 into arts, does, how, does that have to be something that's done at the 1912 building, a public art function that has to be done there? Or it doesn't have to be on the roof, I'm assuming. It has to be. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> Councilor Bullock, I might defer to Gary. I don't fully understand the, the arts component, but I believe it just goes into a fund for arts. It does. It's accumulated in the 1% per, art, per the 1% for arts ordinance, and certain... Uh, Projects qualify. This is one public project that would qualify. It goes in and is accumulated, and then it just funds public art installations or projects throughout the city. It isn't. It isn't. Doesn't have to be affiliated or in the same area of town where the funds were generated. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? <clears throat> David, the the leaking roof is what initiated this. Yes. They, they have active leaks. Yes. And 15 years on the type of roof that was put on in 2001 is its lifetime? That's what I'm hearing from the consultant. It's got about a 12 to 15 year life for a single, single ply membrane, which is getting a little thin at the moment. Um, so we're looking at the end of the service life for the roof. And if I may, uh, Gary, the agreement between the city and the heart of the arts calls for the city to be responsible for capital yes. improvements and maintenance in this falls in that category yes sir and we have money set aside <clears throat> in the budget for this and you've noted that we have we've accumulated one hundred and fifty thousand dollars with the active leak in the roof uh, decided that we would like to propose doing it a little early we have accumulation in uh, parks capital for some other projects as well amounting to about seventy five thousand so we'd like to utilize the hundred and fifty thousand accumulation plus thirty one thousand of that additional accumulation in order to get this done in the next fiscal year okay um, Dwight Clark um, Parks and Rec director would like to speak to this issue good afternoon Dwight hi there sorry to interrupt um, just just so you know um, we've been making repairs for some time sure. um, heart of the arts has been paying for those though this is just bigger it's just to that point but the ongoing repairs this 32,000 is just another one of those but heart of the arts has been paying for that so I'm just telling you it's not just a one time we had to repair it so right right now if it's if it's leaking right now would we have buckets on the unused third floor collecting the moisture that's dripping through to prevent damage to the roof of the Depends usable on, part of the building? They go up and they do patchwork, and, uh, and they've been doing the patchwork for some years now. Um, there, we had one leak that um, actually went through the wall at one time, and uh, that, that caused a lot of damage and cost a lot of money to fix. Um, Heart of the Arts paid for that, but it's it's just to that point where we've got to do something more than than just patch. So that's that's really why we're recommending the overall. And 
Okay. I just wanted to throw that in. I just had a curiosity question. I'm not questioning necessarily your choice of that second option, but the third option with the 80 mil membrane, why is that more expensive than a, an option with twice as much lifespan? Or does that membrane roof have a 30-year lifespan? Uh, good question. Uh, both the option two, which is option three on the yeah. slide for the, the uh, PVC membrane, right. is um, that also has a 30-year warranty. Okay. So okay. it's apples that to apples. Both are 30-year warranties. Okay. Um, the existing roof, the TPO, has a service life of about 15 years, and it's a single-ply um, membrane. Okay. Cool. It just seemed remarkably expensive if it had a 15-year lifespan. So thank you for clarifying that. Okay. I'm, I'm okay with approving it. Yeah, me too. Okay, I think this is a consent agenda item. Um, we can yeah. move forward with this. Okay. Gary? We'll do, so. Yeah, absolutely. We'll thank you. All right, thank you for your presentation, Dave. Thanks, David. Uh, Sixth Street Bridge Rehab Funding Project. Elisa Anderson will tell us about that. The long awaited Sixth Street Bridge Rehabilitation Project. Good afternoon. So Nate's pulling up a, a couple of slides for us. We also had pictures in the um, in the packet, um, but just in case we need to point out some specific areas, we have this for you today. Um, the local highway technical assistance council uh, hosts the FY17. Um, bridge program and it's funding that actually is um, uh, given to ITD from the federal government and then they have LTAC manage it for them which is the local highway technical assistance council and they do this on an annual basis um, cities and counties are eligible to apply for one bridge per year um, this is the first time that we've applied for this program while I've been here um, I know the county uses it quite frequently um, their solicitation came out um, within the last few weeks and it kind of the deadline hit us right in the middle of the holiday season and so we apologize um, we're asking for a ratification today um, we put the application together and um, as described in the staff report the bridge didn't qualify for replacement it only re qualifies re for rehabilitation um, I'm sorry let's just say that again um, under the criteria, and I um, provided that to you in the, the program description, the bridge qualifies for um, rehabilitation but not replacement. <coughs> um, the rating for the bridge, um, as shown in the report that ITD provided us in November of 2015, um, rates the bridge at 63.4. And in order for replacement, you'd have to have a rating of 50 or less. In order to do re rehabilitation, you can be between 50 and 75. And I'm not sure I totally understand the bridge ratings. When we get to Nate, he might be able to explain those a little bit better to you. But if you refer back in your packet under the ITD report, it shows um, a sufficiency rating of 63.4%. And that's on the top of, um, under the first box on the structure inventory and appraisal update report. So we were only able to qualify for an upgrade to the bridge or a um, rehabilitation. Um, and with that, we can go ahead and add the pedestrian um, and ADA compliance activities. So we'd add the bike lane and also then the sidewalk. <coughs> maybe. So. What, what's the rehab work of this? The sidewalks and the bike lanes are additional width. Mm -hmm. What's the rehab part of this thing? So the proposal would be to extend the, in this case, we've got a couple of round culverts and an eccentric pipe arch to extend those approximately 35 feet on each side, add um, head walls and wing walls, so add a concrete structure that will help to protect um, this, this culvert in the future because we are seeing a little bit of scour, a little bit of washing away of the material that's bedding that, and some erosion. So that concrete structure would help to protect that and would also allow us to gain that additional width that's needed um, to 
provide the bike lanes and the uh, sidewalks. So if I, you're, so you're not really working on the existing structure. You're protecting it and expanding it for sidewalks and bike lanes. Yeah. Okay. So in order to qualify, we, this has to be considered functionally obsolete, and by City of Moscow standards, um, for Collector Street, it is that. It would, it would be our hope that they look at the budget for this rehabilitation and possibly realize that it might cost more to or less to replace it, but um, that will be a discussion that we can possibly have with them later. But for right now, we needed to follow the program guidelines to get it submitted. There are some new technologies out for um, bridge replacement that might work better and could possibly be less. But um, at this point, we'll just we'll go with what we qualify for, and hopefully we can have that discussion with them. Fairly spendy rehab. Yes, it is. It is. Um, as I stated in the staff report, and as um, Nate kind of went over, the we have a total project budget within the um, application packet, but the total cost is estimated at $637,000 with a 7.34% estimated um, match, which would be 46756 leaving us a federal aid request of 590244 um, We would anticipate that if approved, um, we would move through the um, the plan, the Idaho Transportation Improvement Plan, and be um, slated for um, design in 2018 and construction or rehabilitation in the years of 19 or 20. Um, That's when the match will be budgeted. We don't. We would have to uh, possibly put down um, a percentage in 2018 to cover the design um, if that is, is contracted out. <coughs> So um, with today's uh, request, um, Nate has a couple of slides he'd like to show to you also, but I think in the packet there were several pictures that um, showed the deterioration in detail. And within the, um, on the packet we also talked about um, how the bridge fits into the overall traffic flow and the corridor development. I did have a typo in there. Um, the uh, Moscow Playfields opened up in May of 2016, and I had in the fall of 2015, I think they were ready, but the grass needed to grow at that point, so we waited to open. So I'll let Nate go ahead and kind of go over um, his slides with you before we okay. move forward. So just kind of wanted to summarize some of the information that we had talked about. So the background of this is that this is the lowest, this is the bridge with the lowest efficiency rating in the city of Moscow with a 63.4. So actually that means we're doing pretty well on our bridges, but it would, it would be nice to be able to, to address this issue. So we have a current bridge width of 30 feet and our collector standard requires a minimum of 46 feet, which is the proposed um, expansion distance. So. Um, you can see here I've provided, um, this is a visual that was, this is not a design document, but it's just a visual that was presented for the 6th Street and Mountain View proposed roundabout. And you can see at that red uh, mark that I made, essentially the pedestrian facilities just end at the creek crossing here. So this would be um, a problematic issue that would require any pedestrians to shift into the roadway with, if this um, bridge is not expanded prior to this construction. And then finally, um, you can see here is just a, a very simple visual of the uh, proposed bridge abutments and the sidewalk path, which would, this would be taking us down to the, the minimum width of 46 feet. So we would be not expanding any further than we absolutely needed to. And if, are there any questions on some of the slides that I put up here? Your, uh, if I may, your center line of the, and I, I think it's a stretch to call this a bridge. It's more like a covered <laughs> crossing. It is. <laughs> but the center line would remain the same? It would. Okay, because so we, we, were, we were contacted by email by someone that was wondering if this would have any impact on the ability to do a future roundabout at 6th and Mountain View. And if the center line remains the same, it shouldn't make any difference to No, this would be designed so that it interacts with that 6th and Mountain View roundabout. That's all I've got. I'm, I'm good with it. Okay. 
I just had a, a question. You mentioned that the budget might be big enough that, that it will be of notice and that, that what are the possibilities of that kind of thing happening? Well, um, I think we'll start that conversation next week maybe <laughs> and find out what they think, now, you know, once they get the application. We have a, a call mm -hmm. scheduled with LTAC um, on Wednesday on another project, and so I had hoped then to maybe um, – ask, you know, who should we speak to about this, but they have one person that manages the bridge programs there. And so we'll we'll check with them and see if possibly this could be moved into another category. We just, um, like I said, didn't have time to take care of that ahead of time. And sure. I think once they yeah. put out this um, guidance, we really have to follow it. But but they are known to be very workable um, in, in budgets and types of projects. And have uh, worked, LTAC has worked very well with us in the past on on the, here's our local safety improvement projects, and we've worked with them on several of those. So, um, A definition, we could not apply for a new bridge with this grant in this place. <laughs> no, okay. we could yeah. not. This is only for rehabbing existing bridges. Yes, we, we would have had to have a rating of 50 or below. Based on the sufficiency yeah. rating from the report, yes. Not quite sure how, you know. I there might have there may have been some additional deterioration since that last bridge report, and that will be something that we'll possibly ask if they can come out and rate it again. Yeah. Um, yes. Nate did check with the um, reports that we got for 2016 in November, and this bridge was not included in those, so it has not been looked yeah. at since I would probably say the summer of 15. So. Um, they're, they're have probably gotten any better since then. I don't think <laughs> Certainly so. Certainly not. And just to note, too, that this um, this bridge had previously been included in our Tiger request. Um, it's it's unknown whether or not that funding will become available this year, but if it is, we um, hopefully would know about this application prior to having Tiger money come out again and reapply. We would be able to reduce our request then. Right on. Okay. Okay. Anything further? No, we just would like to ask for your ratification of this application. They did receive it today, was the deadline. They had to have it by 4.30 today. And so um, if if it were not to be approved, you I would call you, and you ask. Weren't gonna, <laughs> well, they're a little <laughs> hour ahead of us, so. <laughs> well, this, is, this one could not be submitted electronically, so yeah, this is one of the unique. Yeah, yeah I'd recommend approval and to the, the council ratify the action yeah. after the fact. I'll second Sam? that. I'm concerned yeah. if it's okay with the yes. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you. Next year. Put a plank across there and call it insufficient bridge. Rehab. That's all staff has, sir. Okay. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Absolutely. All those in favor? Aye. We stand adjourned. Thank you all for coming.